So um, thank you all for being here, participating online. Um, I'll be covering section GG. So the first part, um, I'll spend uh, just over an hour uh, this morning talking about uh, just some general principles, talking about self-care, uh, getting into a little bit of mobility, then we'll take a break and then we'll come back and wrap up uh, talking about mobility and also a little bit about the quality measure associated with the items. So to begin with, um, as with all the presentations, there is a lot of acronyms. So we have a list of the acronyms on two slides at the beginning um, of your presentation in case you're, you have questions about anything that we use throughout this presentation. The objectives of this session then are that uh, following this uh, session, you'll be able to demonstrate an understanding of the standardized item in section GG, functional abilities and goals. You'll be able to describe the intent, coding instructions and definitions for each section GG items. And third, you'll be able to apply coding instructions to accurately code practice scenarios and the case study. So we have a few um, scenarios here and there. There's a couple of videos that are new to the training materials. And then um, Charlotte and Kathy will have a case study um, this afternoon. So just to give you kind of big picture overview, um, within section GG, there are several items that are uh, referencing prior functioning, prior device use, and because that really asks about the person's status prior to the current um, event that uh, led to the uh, person needing care, that's only collected once at either start of care or resumption of care. So that's only collected at that one time point per episode. And then there's also self-care and mobility activities, and those are GG0130, GG0170, and those are data are collected at uh, SOC, ROC, follow-up, as well as discharge from the uh, agency uh, that's not an inpatient uh, facility. So many of you may be wondering why uh, Section GG is being added onto the OASIS. So CMS is aligning quality measurement across post-acute care settings in response to the IMPACT Act, the Improving Medicare Post-Acute Care Transformation Act, which was passed in 2014. The move towards standardized data elements is um, anticipated to facilitate cross-setting data collection, quality measurement, outcome comparison, as well as interoperability uh, data exchange. I know that was a conversation yesterday about exchanging information across settings and the fragmentation that currently exists. So the Impact Act um, was uh, part of uh, trying to help that issue. Also, uh, Section GG was uh, added to the OASIS uh, for quality measurement, including alignment with the other post-acute care settings, including the inpatient rehab facilities, skilled nursing facilities, and long-term care hospitals. So if uh, any of you are involved in those settings, you know that the Section GG items were implemented in those settings uh, prior to them being implemented in the home health setting. And just in case you're wondering uh, what those look like, so you see here actually on this slide screenshots from the OASIS uh, home health data set and then the MDS and skilled nursing facilities, the IRFPI for the inpatient rehab facilities, and the LTAC care data set, uh, LTAC has um, selected items also. There are differences between Section GG and the M items that you have been uh, collecting for a while. So the item definitions are different, and I really appreciated the comment somebody made a little bit ago about the importance of the definitions. Um, again, uh, there are definitions in the manual. We will be covering those today to make sure that you have a good understanding of those. So it's important to understand the tasks uh, that are included within an activity. So. Um, for example, eating. Uh, I'll talk about specifically what is included and also what isn't included, and we'll have some examples about that. As you're also aware, the uh, co rating scale, the coding scales for the Section GG items are different than the Section M items. So another question that uh, is often asked is, uh, how will the Section GG data be used? 
So the data are used to calculate a cross-setting quality process measure called application of the percent of long-term care hospital patients with an admission and discharge functional assessment and a care plan that addresses function. So this quality measure is um, a, a modified version of a quality measure that was uh, NQF endorsed for the long-term care hospital uh, setting. That's why the name has long-term care hospital in it. And it was adapted for cross-setting use. And it is basically, it reports the percent of patients with uh, SOC, ROC, and a discharge functional assessment and a treatment goal that addresses function. So at this point, uh, CMS has adopted this one quality measure associated with the um, Section GG items. I know there's been some questions coming in already about measuring um, outcomes. So at this point, uh, CMS has just adopted this process measure. And at the end of the presentation, I will give a brief overview of that quality measure. So to begin with, the um, I mentioned that there are several questions early on in the data set that are just collected at the start of care, resumption of care, and those relate to prior functioning. So the first item is GG0110 and it's prior functioning everyday activities. The intent of this item is to identify patients' usual activities prior to their current illness, exacerbation, or injury. If you look at the data set, and for those of you who are looking at the information in your packets, there is um, a copy of some the section GG items in the data set in your packet. Um, and this is what it looks like. And so in terms of what gets coded, the first item within this um, data element relates to self-care. And this basically asks about with regard to prior functioning, uh, did the person need assistance with bathing, dressing, using the toilet, or eating prior to the current illness, exacerbation, or injury? We'll talk about the rating scale in just a moment, but uh, you can see that on the left side. Um, so first of all, you'd be coding self-care. Then you would be coding indoor mobility, and that relates to ambulation. So this is coding the, per the um, Patients need for assistance with walking from room to room. This could be with or without an assistive device such as a cane, crutch, or walker prior to the current illness, exacerbation, or injury. The next area is stairs. This is basically coding uh, the person's need for assistance related to going up and down internal or external stairs. Could be with or without devices or a railing. And then finally, Functional cognition, which relates to the person's ability to uh, plan regular tasks, such as shopping, remembering to take medication, and again, relates to prior functioning. So the information can be gathered uh, through a patient interview. Um, if the person is not able to provide that information, family members can also be a source. Also, if there's information in the person's medical record, um, so if you're receiving information from another setting and the information is provided there, that can also be used. In terms of the rating scale, so um, obviously you're asking about some information uh, that is historical, and so the rating scale is fairly simple in that uh, code three would be that the person is independent, and that means the person, the patient, completed the activities by him or herself, with or without an assistive device, but no assistance from a helper. The second option is that the person needs some help, that's code two, and you would code that if the person needs partial assistance from another person to complete the activities. Code one is used if the person is dependent, and that means that the helper completed the activities for the patient. So if the person, let's say, um, was bathed uh, by another person, then that would be coded dependent. There's also a code eight unknown. Um, in some circumstances, you may not be able to get the information, even though you're trying to maybe talk to the person, maybe uh, they're not able to communicate clearly and you have no documentation. And so you have the option to say unknown. Um, also, a code nine could be used, for example, uh, to indicate that the person didn't 
perform the activity prior to the current uh, illness, exacerbation, or injury. So for example, somebody who's been in a wheelchair and does not ambulate, you might code uh, nine for uh, the walking ambulation item. A dash could be entered, but basically a dash here would indicate that you didn't even try and get the information. So um, just to reinforce that, if you have tried, but you cannot get information because the person's not able to provide that or you can't uh, contact a family member to get that information, you should code unknown. So you really shouldn't probably need to code a dash here. The other item that relates to prior functioning is about prior device use, and that's GG0110. And here the intent is that it identifies the patient's use of devices and aids immediately prior to the current illness exacerbation or injury, and it aligns with treatment goals. So prior device use, uh, this is what the item actually looks like. You'll see a list of devices, mobility devices. The information, again, can be gathered via interview of patient or family, um, could also be gathered through medical records. So you would check in this instance uh, any device that applied. Certainly more than one may apply in some instances. The options are manual wheelchair, motorized wheelchair or scooter, mechanical lift, walker, orthotics, prosthetics. If none of those apply, you would just check Z, which indicates none of the above. Uh, we've had some questions in the past about mechanical lifts, so um, just a little bit more detail about that. So a mechanical lift is any device that the patient or caregiver requires for lifting or supporting the patient's body weight. Examples uh, could include, but are not limited to a stair lift, Hoyer lift, or a bathtub lift. We've also had questions in the past about what qualifies as a walker. So any type of walker can apply. Uh, it can include things like a pickup walker, a hemi walker, rolling walker, platform walker. So next, we actually have a video for you to watch, and uh, you'll be asked to code this. So uh, pay attention to what's going on and think about the devices um, that are being asked asked about and what the patient uh, and maybe family member says. Let's watch a scenario of an assessing clinician collecting information from multiple sources to code GG0110 prior device use. I noticed you have a few different devices here, Mr. Smith. Which of these were you using to help you walk just before you went to the hospital? I wasn't using anything. I was walking on my own. How's it going? Can I help answer anything? I was just asking your husband which of these devices he used to help him walk before going to the hospital. Oh, he was using that cane over there to help him get around. Oh, yeah, I guess I was using that. Okay, good. It also says here in your hospital discharge paperwork that you're using a walker before you were admitted. Is that right? Uh, yeah, I guess I used that when I went outside. Okay, and I see a wheelchair over there. Were you also using that? Uh, no, that's mine. I was using it when I had chemotherapy last year. Okay, thank you for clarifying. And were you using anything else like a shoe insert or a chairlift in another room, anything like that? No, that's all. Just what I told you. Let's examine what you just watched. The clinician interviewed Mr. Smith and his wife using observations of the environment to ask probing questions. The clinician also referred to Mr. Smith's acute care medical record and confirmed the information with Mr. Smith and his wife. In this scenario, the clinician used multiple sources of information to determine that Mr. Smith was using a walker and a cane prior to his recent hospitalization. Prior use of a cane is not captured in GG0110, so only option D, walker, should be checked. This video provided you with an overview of how to use information from multiple sources to accurately code GG0110 prior device use. Collecting information from multiple sources ensures accuracy in coding. In this scenario, if the clinician did not use multiple sources, he may not have received enough information to make an accurate assessment of Mr. Smith's prior device use. We hope you found this scenario helpful. For more information on coding Section GG, refer to your setting-specific guidance manual on the CMS website. 
Great. So uh, you heard the answer in there that you would check Walker. So does that make sense? Okay, great. And the rationales here, again, the, this part of the slides will be posted when all of the uh, scenario answers are posted. Okay, so moving on now to the section uh, GG0130 and GG0170, I'll cover some general principles related to self-care mobility together, and then we'll start going through the uh, individual items for self-care. So uh, the intent of the items, uh, so both uh, GG130 and GG170, um, the intent is to identify the patient's ability to perform those activities, self-care and mobility activities. Um, as I said before, the time point, so uh, these, at the start of care and resumption of care, you will be coding performance, so somebody's ability to perform the activity, and also you will be um, asked to code discharge goals on the uh, SOC ROC assessment. There is follow-up um, time point and there's follow-up performance that would be assessed, so not goals, but just the performance at follow-up. And then for discharge, there's also uh, performance that's assessed. And that's um, for uh, patients who are not uh, discharged to an inpatient facility. So uh, just to give a little bit of, uh, I guess, some principles, so qualified uh, licensed clinicians may assess the patient's performance based on direct observation, which is the preferred method of data collection. But also you can get information based on self-report from patients who provide credible information, clinicians, care staff, and or family members. When possible, CMS invites multidisciplinary approach to data collection. So patients, when you're um, assessing their abilities, patients should be able to perform activities as independently as possible, as long as they're safe. If the helper um, is providing assistance that's required due to the patient's uh, poor performance, let's say somebody has difficulty walking, uh, you would code based on the amount of assistance being provided. Activities should be completed with or without assistive devices. Use of assistive devices to complete an activity would not increase or decrease somebody's score. You just code the amount of uh, human assistance basically required to complete the activity. Patients with cognitive impairments and limitations may need physical assistance, um, such as uh, verbal assistance also when completing an activity. So you would again code just based on the amount of assistance provided, whether the person is requiring assistance due to cognitive issues or physical limitations, both would be coded just based, again, on the amount of assistance provided. Code based on the patient's need for assistance to perform the activity safely. So for example, um, if somebody has a, a choking risk due to the rate of eating, somebody's eating really quickly, um, you might be providing some cueing, and so again, assistance is related to queuing in that instance. So on the uh, SOC rock, you will notice two columns. The first column, which is highlighted in yellow here, is the performance column. And uh, that was the self-care items. And here are the mobility items. You'll notice that there's, um, in the mobility section, there's some uh, kind of gateway and follow-up questions. And so you see those a little bit indented. In terms of um, more specific instructions on actual coding, so uh, the patient's functional status should be based on a functional assessment that occurs soon after the patient uh, is uh, starting care or resuming care. It should reflect the patient's uh, baseline status and based on observation to the extent possible. When possible, the assessment should occur prior to therapy services to capture the patient's true baseline status. Therapy interventions can affect somebody's functional status. So if you're not doing an assessment close to the time of start of care or resumption of care, the person may have benefited from perhaps therapy services already. So we're trying to um, gather baseline assessment data for start of care. 
Patients' functional ability can be impacted by the environment or situations encountered in their home. So observing the patient perhaps in different locations or circumstances is important as part of a comprehensive understanding of the patient's functional status. If the patient's status varies during the assessment time frame, please code the patient's usual performance um, to perform the activity. Do not record the person's best performance or worst performance, but again, what the person usually does. So the maximum uh, number of days uh, within which the comprehensive assessment is the assessment time frame. And then when we talk about usual ability, that refers to the patient's usual ability, his or her ability um, greater than 50% of the uh, time during the assessment time frame. So um, we talked about the first column, which is performance. Now we're moving to the second column, which is goal. So again, the expected um, ability of the person by the time that the home care um, episode will end is what you code in the second column, the discharge goal. And that's only collected at uh, start of care and resumption of care. This is the mobility. Um, so it's both self-care and mobility goals. So with regard to the goal, um, most of the goals will be coded using the six-point rating scale. We'll be covering that in just a minute. Um, you may also code uh, one of the activity not attempted codes, which we'll be going over shortly, which are 7, 9, 10, and 88. But probably that won't be happening often. That's kind of rare. I think in the last session we did, uh, people said, can you give examples of 10, and it should be pretty rare. So most of the time goals would be um, somebody uh, being coded as being independent through dependent. Um, you, if We'll be talking about the quality measure at the end of the session, but um, if you're not reporting a goal, uh, you can enter a dash. Goals may be coded so that they reflect that the person is performing expected to perform at the same level that the person was at the start of care and resumption of care. So for example, if you say somebody is, ex is independent on admission with eating, it may be that they're expected to maintain their independence at discharge, and so you would code them six on admission at start of care, and uh, the goal would be six. So it's the same in that instance. It's possible that the person may be, um, let's say for one of the walking items, they're coded level two, that they need a fair bit of help, but maybe you're, they're expected to just require supervision by discharge, and so their score is going to go up. In some instances, you may also have some patients who are expected to decline, and the goal is to maintain their function. Um, and so there may be some instances, depending on the person, condition that um, it may be possible that uh, you're trying to slow decline and the score actually, it dis the discharge goal may be a little bit lower than the admission assessment. If the uh, sock rock performance of the activity was coded, any of the activity not attempted codes, you can still uh, put a goal in. So perhaps the person was not able to walk on admission um, at start of care, but the person is expected to be ambulating. Uh, you can certainly put in a goal for that. Um, so qualified licensed clinicians can establish discharge goals uh, based on a number of um, considerations, so that would include the person's prior medical condition, um, the information that you're gathering during the SOC rock assessment um, in regard to self-care mobility, discussions with the person and their family um, in terms of their motivation to improve function, professional judgment, professional practice standards, expected number of treatments, uh, patient motivation, anticipated length of stay, as well as the discharge plan. So there's a lot of ju clinical judgment involved in uh, setting discharge goals. In terms of the follow-up performance, so we've talked about uh, the data collection involved at uh, SOC Rock. Now we're moving to the follow-up performance. So there's only three self-care activities at follow-up performance that are um, collected in this area of self-care. And then these are the mobility items. So it is not the full set of items that follow up. It's a subgroup of items. 
And clinicians should code the patient's functional status at follow-up based on the assessment that occurs within the assessment time frame. Now we're moving to discharge. So at discharge, there are seven self-care activities. They're listed here. Again, we'll be going through all of those in a few moments. This, these are the mobility items collected at discharge. Again, just one column related to performance. And you'll see the indented. Um, there's a few uh, gateway, one gateway question and a couple of follow-up uh, questions related to wheelchair. So with regard to the um, uh, discharge performance. The discharge time period under consideration includes the last five days of care. So this includes the day of discharge and the four preceding calendar days. Code the patient's functional status based on the functional assessment that occurs close to the time of discharge. The span of time uh, for the data collection uh, is what we're talking about when we're talking about the time period under consideration. Um, for other items, item wording or related guidance will specify the time period under consideration, such as since the most recent sock rock. So now the rating scale. So um, I think many of you have had experience with this already. And so uh, basically this is an independent scale. So a higher score means the person is uh, more independent. Code six means the person is independent, again, with or without a device is still coded independent. Level five is supervision, or I'm sorry, level five is setup or cleanup assistance. Level four is supervision or touching assistance. Level three is partial or moderate assistance. Level two is substantial or maximal assistance. And level one is dependent. I mentioned earlier that there are codes to indicate that you were unable to assess the patient for various reasons. And so I wanted to go over those next. So a code seven would indicate that the patient refused to perform the activity. So it's possible that the patient is refusing, let's say to maybe go up and down stairs. And so you would code 07 for that. Um, if the activity was not applicable, and that means that the patient is not performing the activity at the point of assessment, and the person did not perform that activity prior to the current illness, exacerbation, or injury, that's coded 09. So an example here might be somebody who, um, let's say for many years, has been in a wheelchair and not ambulating, and so Basically, they have some kind of new medical event that triggers getting home care, but they haven't, let's say, walked, uh, pri they weren't walking immediately prior to the um, event that triggered this episode of care. And so uh, that, in that instance, the walking items would be coded 09. Code 10, which is a new code, um, relates to you're not being able to assess the person because of environmental limitations. So for example, car transfers, uh, you may not, uh, if the person doesn't have a car and there's not one um, that's available or the person isn't able to report on that. So it's possible you may be coding 10 for a car transfer or walking on uneven surfaces. There may be environmental limitations. Um, I know especially you know, in the walk in the winter, um, I live in Chicago, so you know if it's really cold, people won't be taken outside to test some of those things. And then finally, the code 88, not attempted due to medical conditions or safety concern. Um, this is actually the code that we see most often coded when an activity is not attempted, and that's because somebody has a new medical issue going on. Um, so the difference between 09 and 88 is going to relate to whether the person was performing the activity prior to the current illness, exacerbation, or injury. And we do have a few practice scenarios related to this, so we'll revisit that topic shortly. But again, probably most instances when somebody is not performing an activity cannot be assessed, 88 is going to probably be your most common reason. So. Um, now we're going to actually watch a video, and this is about, I think, nine minutes long. So um, I hope it will be helpful, but it will just kind of walk you through the decision making. And what we're hoping to do is to give you an idea about how to think about how to code so that it seems like a, uh, you're, you're 
It'll talk about the key coding questions that you need to consider, and we're hoping to help you kind of think through how to code. And we'll, um, I'll be reinforcing this as we go through scenarios later on. So I will get the video going. We will walk through the decision tree for coding GG0130, self-care, and GG0170, mobility, highlighting each coding level using an example of a patient, Mrs. Jones, completing GG0170D, sit to stand. The decision tree presents a series of yes-no questions, represented by diamonds, that guide you to the correct code for your patient or resident. Accurate coding is important to capture patient and resident safety, appropriate goal setting, and accurate evaluation of the patient's or resident's functional ability at discharge. The first question in the decision tree asks, does the patient or resident complete the activity, with or without assistive devices, by him or herself and with no assistance, including physical, verbal, or nonverbal cueing, setup, or cleanup? If the answer to this question is yes, the correct code for this patient or resident is 06 independent. Let's view an example of Mrs. Jones completing the sit to stand activity independently. In this scenario, Mrs. Jones is sitting up on the side of the bed. She retrieves her walker and places it in front of her. Then, she safely rises to a standing position. Once standing, she holds on to the walker to steady herself. There is no assistance provided by a helper. If, however, the answer to this first question is no, the patient or resident is not able to complete the activity by him or herself without assistance, proceed to the next question. The second question in the decision tree asks, does the patient or resident need only setup or cleanup assistance from one helper? If the answer to this question is yes, the correct code for this patient or resident is 05, setup or cleanup assistance. Let's review an example of the same patient, Mrs. Jones, completing the sit to stand activity, but this time with setup or cleanup assistance. In this scenario, Mrs. Jones is sitting up on the side of the bed. She retrieves her walker and places it in front of her. Then, a helper raises the bed rail. Mrs. Jones grasps the bed rail and safely rises to a standing position. Once standing, she holds onto the walker to steady herself. In this example, the patient completes the activity by herself with setup assistance. Setup assistance is demonstrated by the helper raising the bed rail. So, you would code this 05, setup or cleanup assistance. If, however, the answer to this question is no, the patient or resident requires more than setup or cleanup assistance to complete the activity, proceed to the next question. The third question in the decision tree asks Does the patient or resident need only verbal or nonverbal cueing, or steadying, touching, or contact guard assistance from one helper? If the answer to this question is yes, the correct code for this patient or resident is 04, supervision or touching assistance. Let's review an example of the same patient, Mrs. Jones, completing the sit to stand activity, but this time with supervision or touching assistance. In this scene, Mrs. Jones is sitting up on the side of the bed. She retrieves her walker and places it in front of her. Then, a helper raises the bed rail and provides cues for hand placement. I'm going to tell you how to do it safely. The helper also provides instructions to help Mrs. Jones safely rise to a standing position. Once standing, Mrs. Jones holds onto the walker to steady herself. In this scenario, Mrs. Jones needs verbal and nonverbal cueing from one helper, so you would use code 04, supervision or touching assistance. If, however, the answer to this question is no, the patient or resident requires more than supervision or touching assistance to complete the activity, proceed to the next question. The fourth question in the decision tree asks, does the patient or resident need physical assistance, for example, lifting or trunk support, from one helper with the helper providing less than half of the effort? If the answer to this question is yes, the correct code for this patient or resident is 03, partial, moderate assistance. Let's review an example of Mrs. Jones completing the sit-to-stand activity, but this time with partial, moderate assistance. In this scene, Mrs. Jones is sitting up on the side of the bed. 
She retrieves her walker and places it in front of her. Oh, good morning. A helper raises the bed rail, secures a gate belt around her waist, and provides instructions regarding the transfer. One hand on the rail. You're going to put one on the hand on the bed. Uh -huh. We're going to go on the count of three, all right? Then, while holding Mrs. Jones, the helper provides a slight upward boost using the gate belt. Mrs. Jones, who is bearing most of the weight, rises safely to a standing position. In this example, Mrs. Jones needs physical assistance with the helper providing less than half of the effort. So you would code this 03 partial moderate assistance. If, however, the answer to this question is no, the patient or resident requires more than partial moderate assistance to complete the activity, proceed to the next question. The fifth question in the decision tree asks, does the patient or resident need physical assistance, for example, lifting or trunk support from one helper, with the helper providing more than half of the effort? If the answer to this question is yes, the correct code for this patient or resident is 02 substantial maximal assistance. Let's review an example of the same patient, Mrs. Jones, completing the sit-to-stand activity, but this time with substantial maximal assistance. In this scene, Mrs. Jones is sitting up on the side of the bed. She retrieves her walker and places it in front of her. A helper raises the bed rail, secures a gate belt around Mrs. Jones' waist, and provides instruction regarding the transfer. We're going to work together. Okay. Okay, on the count of three. Three. Okay. Using the gate belt, the helper lifts Mrs. Jones, bearing most of her weight during the transfer. One, two, two, three. The helper provides continual assistance as she moves Mrs. Jones to a standing position. In this scenario, Mrs. Jones needs physical assistance with the helper providing more than half of the effort. So you would code this 02 substantial maximal assistance. If, however, the answer to this question is no, the patient or resident requires more than substantial maximal assistance from one helper to complete the activity, proceed to the next question. The sixth and final question in the decision tree asks, does the helper provide all the effort to complete the activity, or is the assistance of two or more helpers required to complete the activity? If the answer to this question is yes, the correct code for this patient or resident is 01, dependent. Let's review a final example of the same patient, Mrs. Jones, completing the sit-to-stand activity, but this time the patient is dependent on two helpers to complete the activity. In this scene, two helpers are assisting Mrs. Jones. One helper secures a gate belt around Mrs. Jones' waist, while the other helper provides instructions about the transfer. On three, we're going to stand up. One, two, three, all the way up tall. Okay. Both helpers provide continual assistance as they move Mrs. Jones to a standing position, using the gate belt to fully support her weight. Once standing, Mrs. Jones holds onto the walker to steady herself. In this scenario, Mrs. Jones needs the physical assistance of two or more helpers to complete this activity, so you would code this 01 dependent. This video provided you with an overview of the decision tree for coding GG0130 self care and GG0170 mobility. We reviewed a series of key coding questions to help you identify the correct code for your patient or resident. Accurate coding is important to capture patient and resident safety appropriate goal setting, and accurate evaluation of the patient's or resident's functional ability at discharge. We hope you found this video helpful. For more information on coding section GG, refer to your setting-specific guidance manual that can be found on the CMS website. Great, so I hope you found that helpful. Um, basically, um, you know, for all of the activities, that's the thinking that should be happening as you're thinking about how to code. So does the person need help? If they need help, what type and amount of assistance is needed? So again, we'll be reinforcing this uh, throughout the day. And I do want to highlight that within your training packet, you do have a document that is um, a copy of the decision tree. It's actually on the back side. You'll see it's uh, uh, ovals as opposed to uh, diamonds, but the uh, kind of decision tree is there for you.
Yeah, sit to stand. Um, yeah, we can we can uh, cover that during the Q and A's. Um, can can you submit it so that we remember to cover that? Yeah, yeah. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So um, wanted to just talk about again the. Uh, activity not attempted code. So the decision tree basically um, covers where somebody can perform the activity, but in the event that a person cannot perform the activity, uh, you would code one of the activity not attempted codes. So they're listed in the second bullet here, 7, 9, uh, 10, and 88. Um, and I just want to reinforce that you should not code a dash just because somebody cannot perform an activity. If you're um, Entering a dash, that means that you didn't try to do an assessment, you don't know anything. But in many instances, somebody actually may not be able to perform an activity. So for example, somebody may not be able to walk 150 feet, and so maybe you know they have a cardiac problem, in addition they've had a stroke. And so um, if this is a new onset, you would code 88, don't code a dash. It should be rare that you would ever need to code a dash. Another coding tip I uh, just wanted to cover is that the use um, of assistive devices and adaptive equi equipment required to complete an activity would not increase or decrease the score. Um, you code the person based on any equipment or device that they use. If the only help needed um, to perform an activity is to retrieve an assistive device, then that would be coded five setup or cleanup. And uh, we saw an example of that in the video. Um, as uh, was also uh, covered in the video, if the assistance of two or more helpers is required, you code one dependent. So um, we'll be, again, reinforcing that and some of the examples. So now, if you don't mind pulling out your phones or computers, we're going to do a Slido um, example. And the question here that should be popping up for you is, what is the preferred method for assessing the patient's self-care or mobility performance? And if you can put your responses in, the options are uh, patient self-report, family report, direct observation, and report from other care staff. So it looks like we have about 40 people who have submitted so far. Okay, it looks like people are still submitting. There seems to be an overwhelming response. <laughs> okay, so I'll go ahead and uh, move on. Uh, you are correct indeed. Direct observation is the preferred uh, way of gathering information. And the rationale is that qualified licensed clinicians may assess the person's performance based on direct observation, which is the preferred method, uh, as well as uh, reports from the patient, clinicians, care staff, or family. Another um, question for you, which examples below best demonstrate how the patient, um, allowing the patient to perform as independently as possible? Um, so the first example is the person uh, feeding a patient who can feed himself in order to expedite meal time, allowing the patient to brush her teeth as much as possible, assisting only when she becomes fatigued, providing the patient with a bedside commode when he is capable of walking to the bathroom with assistance, or none of the above. All right, it looks like there is an overwhelming uh, response for uh, B. Okay, all right, we'll go ahead and uh, do the answer for that. So yes, indeed, um, allowing the person to brush his or her teeth um, as much as possible. And again, you know, with all of the activities, allow the person to be as independent as possible, provide assistance, obviously, to keep the person safe during the assessment. Um, in the video, you saw the person, uh, you know, obviously, uh, with different situations, but um, in real, uh, care, you would allow the person to do as much as they can on their own. And the rationale is here, again, um, allowing the patient to brush her teeth as much as possible supports patient goals towards independence. It allows her to participate in the activity to the fullest extent possible, only receiving assistance from the caregiver as needed. Another question, since Mrs. W uses a rolling walker, she cannot be considered independent for the Section GG walking items. Is that true or is that false? Okay, so just the use of a device, can somebody be independent? 
And by the way, if uh, you do have on Slido the question, and then also all of these examples are in your packet if you wanted to follow along there also. So it looks like uh, people have responded and the correct response is false. And it looks like most of you got that correct. Rationale, use of the assistive devices and adaptive equipment required to complete the activity would not affect the score in terms of increasing or decreasing the score. So now we're going to get into the specific uh, coding instructions related to the items and do some more practice scenarios. So the first activity in self-care is eating. And eating is defined as the ability to use suitable utensils to bring food and or liquid to the mouth and swallow food and or liquid once the meal is placed before the patient. And one of the commonly asked questions about this uh, relates to patients who may be using or getting nutrition through maybe a G-tube or um, total parenteral nutrition. And so just wanted to kind of reinforce the guidance. So to code eating, um, the person must be uh, bringing food to the mouth in order to code the item as defined in section GG. If the person uses uh, alternative means of getting nutrition, the question would be whether they are also eating by mouth. So if assistance with tube feedings um, uh, or total parenteral nutrition is provided, that's actually not taken into consideration. If the patient does not eat or drink by mouth and solely requires on these alternative means of getting fluid and, and uh, nutrition, and it's due to a recent onset condition, you would code 88. If the patient does not eat or drink by mouth at the time of the assessment, and let's say this person had a stroke many years ago and has not been eating or drinking, and they've been on tube feeding, let's say, for you know five years or something, you would code nine not applicable. And in the event that somebody perhaps eats a little bit by mouth or a lot by mouth and then has supplemental feedings, perhaps they're just getting some water, maybe through G-tube, um, to supplement uh, liquids, then you would code eating based on the person's uh, ability to eat by mouth and how much assistance was be being provided related to eating by mouth. So the bottom line is the kind of medical, proce medical um, procedure of uh, providing G-tube feedings is not considered. Just think about how much help somebody needs in terms of eating by mouth. So here we have a practice scenario. So if you, again, can pull out your phones or your computers, um, Mr. R is unable to eat or drink by mouth since he had a stroke one week ago. He receives nutrition and hydration through a G-tube, which is administered by a helper. How would you code GG-0130A? Um, this is, let's say, an admission assessment. Um, options are to code 1, dependent, 2, substantial maximal assistance, 9, not applicable, or 88, not attempted due to a medical condition or safety concern. So again, uh, you're only considering eating by mouth, so you don't worry about anything that's happening related to G-tube. Um, so the question is, did the activity of eating occur? And if it didn't, you would uh, be coding one of the activity not attempted codes. It says that it was a recent stroke, so it, the person was eating by mouth prior to the current illness, exacerbation, or injury. Looks like most people, um, looks like 106 people have submitted so far, and uh, the main code uh, that was selected was 88, which is the correct code. And again, it's not coded 9 because it was a recent stroke, so he was eating by mouth prior to the event. Maybe that wasn't clear. Um, but you would only code 9 if the person was not eating prior to the current illness, exacerbation, or injury. And again, the rationale, um, you know, the activity did not occur. And so it's going to be one of the activity not attempted codes. So he's not dependent because we, are, we do not take into consideration the G-tube administration. The next activity is oral hygiene. Oral hygiene is defined as the ability to use suitable utensils to clean teeth. Dentures, if applicable, would include the ability to remove and replace dentures from and to the mouth and manage equipment for soaking and rinsing the dentures. 
Just a coding tip, if the patient does not perform oral hygiene during the home visit, determine the patient's abilities based on the patient's performance of similar items during the assessment or um, based on patient caregiver report. There's a, uh, another video here, so I will get that. Here you see the helper providing assistance to Mr. Smith as he walks to the bathroom. Once in front of the bathroom sink, the helper retrieves and puts toothpaste on Mr. Smith's toothbrush and hands it to him. The helper then steadies Mr. Smith's arm as he brushes his teeth. Once Mr. Smith has finished brushing his teeth, the helper rinses his toothbrush and puts it away. The helper then provides steadying assistance as Mr. Smith walks back to bed. Okay, great. So um, just to kind of walk through what you saw. So um, again, the definition of oral hygiene relates to brushing teeth. It does not include walking to and from the bathroom. So that's an important definition issue to pay attention to. Um, if you were thinking through the decision tree, so if you want to pull out your decision tree, you'd first of all say, you know, was um, assistance needed? And the answer was yes, there was a helper there. And then the question was, uh, does the person need only set up or clean up assistance or was there more assistance? So that would be uh, leading you to the next question. If the person uh, provides steadying, touching assistance during any of the self-care activities because the person maybe has a balance problem, that would be considered assistance related to self-care. So in eating, you know, most of the people will be probably sitting to eat, but in this instance, he's standing up in front of the sink and uh, maybe had some balance problems. And so there was um, a, a therapist or a helper providing some uh, assistance there. So, um, based on what you saw, how would you code? The options are code five, set up, clean up assistance, uh, four, supervision touching assistance, three, partial moderate assistance, and two, substantial maximal assistance. So again, you walk through the decision tree. If the person gets more than just set up, you would go to a lower code. Looks like the majority of you are coding uh, B, which is uh, four, so we will go to the answer now, and that is indeed the correct answer. So again, if you're thinking through the decision tree, you would only stop at the decision tree level five if the person only got supervision or setup. In this case, she stayed with him and steadied him as he was brushing his teeth, so that's why you go down to the level four. And in this case, it was steadying assistance, um, Maybe that wasn't clear to some of the video. I think some of you put three, but um, level three, you would be providing actual more assistance than just steadying assistance. So here's the rationale uh, for code four, supervision or touching assistance. Okay, the next activity is uh, toileting hygiene. So toileting hygiene relates to the ability to maintain perineal hygiene, adjust clothing before and after avoiding or having a bowel movement. And if the person has an ostomy, it would include basically wiping the opening, but not managing the actual equipment. So again, um, toileting just relates when somebody does go to the bathroom, uh, basically probably pulling pants and underwear down for most people, uh, doing cleansing after uh, voiding or having a bowel move and then pulling the pants back up. So this um, doesn't you know, include actually the, the voiding, but what happens kind of around the voiding or the bowel movement. The next activity is shower bathe self. Um, this activity relates to the ability to uh, bathe the body, which includes washing, rinsing, and drying. It does not include washing of the back and hair, and it does not include transferring into or out of the shower or tub. So again, it's just washing, rinsing, and drying the body. Just some coding tips related to this particular item. Um, the assessment can take place in a shower or a bath or at a sink. So whatever the person is doing, they can be assessed in whatever environment they, um, they uh, do. Uh, the activity, if the patient bathes him or herself, um, and 
uh, helper provide setup of the materials that would be set up or clean up assistance. If the patient cannot bathe his or her entire body because of a medical condition, uh, code based on the overall amount of assistance needed to complete the activity. So if somebody has a cast on or somebody's had an amputation, just code based on uh, what is being bathed. Next is upper body dressing, and upper body dressing relates to the ability to dress um, and undress above the waist. And if um, the person has any fasteners or anything, buttons, things like that, that would be considered as part of that assessment. And um, over the years, uh, we've had many questions about what would be included in upper body versus lower body that's coming up versus footwear. Um, so in addition to the question, great questions that you've um, provided during the training, uh, prior training in November, and some questions that have already come in, um, there's a lot of questions that we've had on the help desks from rehab hospitals and long-term care hospitals, skilled nursing facilities. So we've compiled a list of some examples of upper body dressing um, items. So it can include all kinds of things. Um, a bra, undershirt, t-shirt, um, pullover shirt, sweatshirt. Um, if somebody uses some kind of um, brace, so a TLSO, we get lots of questions about that. Those would be included. Um, abdominal binder, back brace. So basically you would consider these uh, devices, equipment as a piece of clothing. And again, just overall, um, in terms of what the person's wearing, you'd just say, you know, how much help is the provider uh, the helper providing, and how much effort is the person doing. So if you're just, you know, maybe uh, getting um, for upper body, maybe you're getting the person neck brace for them um, and you're passing it to them or putting it within reach for them, that would be setup assistance if that's the only assistance being provided. If you're actually helping them to put on a brace, then they're going to get a lower score depending on how much other effort the person is putting in. So somebody who um, for upper body is wearing, let's say, a bra, a t-shirt, and a sweater, and then they also have a neck brace. There's a, a lot of effort overall, and so you'll just have to make a judgment in terms of is the person doing more than half the effort, less than half of the effort, uh, in terms of all of those uh, pieces of articles of clothing and equipment. For lower body, similar situation. This is defined as the ability to dress and undress below the waist, including fasteners. It does not include footwear because there is a separate item for footwear. Again, thanks to all the wonderful questions that we've had from providers over the years, uh, we've compiled this list of examples of items that may be included for your patients. Um, so underwear, um, in, incontinence brief, certainly, you know, if somebody wears incontinence brief rather than just regular underwear, just treat it like a piece of clothing. Uh, capri pants, if somebody wears pajama bottoms while they're being assessed, that's certainly fine to assess. Um, if they're wearing a knee brace, elastic bandages, any of those kinds of things, you would include those also. And finally, uh, putting on and taking off footwear is the last dressing activity, and this is the ability to put on and take off socks and shoes and any other footwear that is appropriate for safe mobility, including fasteners if applicable. So examples that we've compiled based on your questions, um, footwear would include socks, shoes, boots, running shoes. Um, if somebody uses an AFO, ankle foot orthosis, that would be considered footwear, um, any elastic bandages, any kind of orthotic device, compression stockings would also be considered under footwear. Okay, moving on to the mobility activities now. So um, in this particular uh, section of GG, we're looking at um, Things like uh, bed mobility, so there's several areas related to bed mobility. There's some walking items and some stairs items. I do want to highlight, because I know that there's some questions that have come in um, about skip patterns. So I think the question was basically whether there are skip patterns. So if you do want to look either on the screen or in the packet, you have the actual items. You will notice that there are some skip patterns, um, and that is to reduce burden. So for example, let's see, I'm going to go to the next slide. Um, so uh, for stairs, if um, 
Yeah, so stairs is, is one example. So if the person is not able to go up and down one step, um, the instructions do say that, um, let's see, um, so if, I'm, I'm looking at the discharge one, if discharge performance is coded 07, 9, 10, or 88, so those are the activity not attempted codes. So if somebody is not walking, not able to go up and down one step, uh, they would actually skip over four steps and 12 steps. Um, so if, you know, the idea is that if somebody's not able to go up and down one step, they're probably not able to go up and down four steps or 12 steps. So you just skip over those items. Uh, your s software system wouldn't let you enter items or codes into seven and 12. So you would skip over performance. You may certainly still code a goal because certainly somebody may have a goal to improve uh, their ability to go up and down stairs. So any of the, the goals can be coded for one step, four step, 12 steps. Uh, you're just skipping over the performance column. There's also skip patterns uh, related to the walking items. Uh, 10 feet if somebody is not able to walk uh, 10 feet, um, we think they are not able to walk 50 feet with two turns and 150 feet. So the first activity uh, in the mobility section is roll left to right, and this is the ability to roll um, from lying on their back and uh, to the left side and right side, and then return to lying on the back in the bed. The second uh, bed mobility item is sit to lying. In this case, this refers to the ability to move from sitting on the side of the bed to um, lying flat on the bed. And we do have a practice scenario for this one. So for sit to lying, uh, Mr. A suffered multiple vertebral fractures due to a fall off a ladder. At SOC, he re uh, requires assistance from a therapist to get from a sitting position to, a li to lying flat on the bed because of significant pain in his lower back. The therapist supports his back and lifts both legs to assist Mr. A from sitting uh, from sitting at the side of the bed to lying flat in the bed. Mr. A assists himself a small amount by raising one leg onto the bed and then bending both knees while transitioning into a lying position. So there's a lot of information there. Um, so basically, if you were thinking through the decision tree, you'd first of all say, does um, he need assistance from a helper? The answer is yes. Is it just set up assistance? No, it's more than that. So then you would start to say, is it just steadying supervision assistance or is it more than that? It sounds like it's more. So then the next question would be, is he doing more than half of the effort or is he doing less than half of the effort? If the patient is doing more than half of the effort, it would be a three. If the patient uh, helper is doing more than half of the effort, so the patient's doing less than half of the effort, it would be a two. Um, if the patient is not doing any assistance or the assistance of two helpers is required, then you would go to level one. So you have to think through, okay, is there one helper, more than one helper, when you're kind of at the lower end of the, the decision tree. So if you want to look at the decision tree to kind of think through this, and I will give you the options here that you can put into Slido. Um, those options are five, set up cleanup assistance, four, supervision or touching assistance, three, partial moderate assistance, two, substantial maximal assistance. If you need to look at the scenario, you do have, again, these scenarios in your packets. Okay, so it looks like there's, um, uh, most people are coding two, some people are coding three, so the consideration is who's putting in more of the effort. Um, and let's go to the right answer, which, oops, most of you did get, sorry. Um, so code two is the correct answer here. And in terms of rationale, um, basically the um, patient did do um, less than half of the effort, the patient lifted the one leg that the, uh, th the therapist or the helper did most of the effort in that instance. Okay, the next activity is lying to sitting on the side of the bed. This is an activity that you have had on the OASIS for some time. The definition uh, here is the ability to move from lying 
on the back to sitting on the side of the bed with feet flat on the floor and with no back support. Just some coding tips based on help desk questions that we've had over the years. If a patient's feet do not reach the floor upon lying to sitting, the clinician will determine if uh, bed height adjustment, if that's possible, if applicable, or if footstool is required uh, to accommodate the foot placement uh, on the floor footstool. Um, back support refers to um, an object or person providing support of the patient's back. Um, other coding tips that generally relate to the um, first three activities, so these are um, basically related to lying um, and how to define that. Um, if, the if at the time of assessment the patient is unable to lie flat due to a medical condition or restriction, so perhaps somebody has G-tubes feedings and so they need to be sitting upright, um, uh, so if they uh, could perform the activity prior to the current illness, exacerbation, or injury, but they can't perform it now, you would code 88 not attempted due to medical condition or safety concerns. If at the time of the assessment the person was unable to lie flat, and this has been a long standing, so this person has been on G-tube feedings for many years and has not been able to lie flat for many years, including prior to the current um, exacerbation or injury um, or illness, you would code nine, not applicable. Um, so for section GG um, 0170A through C, those activities that relate to lying, you would use clinical judgment to determine if the person is able to lie in um, a flat position. Um, for example, a clinician would determine that if the person is um, maybe just has the head of the bed uh, raised slightly, that might be considered lying, um, but it would be your clinical judgment whether the person is actually able to perform that activity. And if the activity cannot be performed because the person cannot lie flat, you would not be able to assess those items, and then you would have to think about which activity not attempted code makes sense. Okay, so we do have another video for you here, and I will get that started now. Hi, Mrs. Brown. How are you today? I'm doing a little better, thanks. Good. Can you come sit on the side of the bed for me? It's hard, but I'll try. Looks like you're struggling a bit. Can I help you? Yes, thanks. Okay, first, let me have you try to lie on your side. Great. Now, put your hand on the bed and push yourself up. As you do that, I'm going to put my hand on your upper back and arm and swing your legs until you're in a seated position. Is that okay? Sure. Let's give it a try. Good job. Thanks. Okay. All right. So based on what you saw, how would you code um, this item for this person that you saw. The options are 04, supervision or touching assistance, 03, partial moderate assistance, 2, uh, maximal substantial assistance, and 01, dependent. Okay. So it looks like the key question that you're focused on is whether the person, um, the helper provided more than half of the effort or less than half of the effort, and how much the patient did. So if the patient did more than half of the effort, it would be three. If the patient did less than half of the effort, it would be coded two. And let's see what uh, the correct response is. So the correct response is two. Uh, it may be hard sometimes to see on video. Um, and obviously, if you're providing the care, you would be in a very good position to know exactly how much assistance is provided. Um, but in, in this instance, the um, patient was performing uh, more than half, uh, less than half of the effort, sorry. Okay, it looks like we've lost uh, the slides. There we go, they're back up now, thank you. Okay, so um, the next activity is sit to stand. Sit to stand is defined as the ability to come to a standing position from sitting in a chair, a wheelchair, or sitting on the side of the bed. So anywhere that the person is sitting, uh, you can assess their ability to get from uh, sit to stand. Co
coding tip, if the only help a patient needs to complete the sit-to-stand activity is for a helper to retrieve an assistive device or adaptive equipment, such as a walker or an ankle foot orthosis, then you would enter code 5, setup or cleanup assistance. Um, and I know... Um, Let's see, there was a question about using a sit-to-stand device. So if um, two helpers are there to provide the assistance, that would be coded one. Um, if the person is only getting help from, let's say, one helper, then um, it would be a determination of how much the helper is providing, how much effort the patient's doing. If the patient is doing a little bit of effort, that would be a two. If the patient is doing more than half of the effort, it would be a three. So I hope that answers the question that came in earlier. If not, please do submit a question. Okay, so we have a scenario here um, related to sit to stand. Um, Mr. B is being admitted to home care for pressure ulcer care. He has complete tetraplegia, so he has spinal cord injury from an injury one year ago. So he's got a new medical event that is triggering this um, uh, uh, episode of home care. Um, he's been unable to bear weight in standing uh, since injury, so he has not done a sit to stand because he's unable to bear weight since um, he had a spinal cord injury. At start of care, using a patient lift that does not require him to understand, uh, come to a standing position, he is transferred from his bed to a wheelchair with assistance. How would you code this scenario? The options are code two, code one, dependent, nine, not actable, 88, not attempted due to medical condition or safety concern. Go ahead and answer your, uh, enter your answer. Okay, so I see, um, so uh, it said that the person was not able to bear weight, so the activity of getting from a uh, sitting position to a standing um, position did not occur. So then you would be moving to thinking about one of the activity not attempted codes. And so then you would differentiate between whether this is um, something that the person has had for some time. In this case, he, the patient was admitted with a pressure ulcer injury and it's secondary to a spinal cord injury. That injury though, uh, the person had prior to the current uh, uh, start of care. So in this instance, it looks like most people coded 09. I do agree the correct answer is 09. Again, he had um, the spinal, uh, the pressure ulcer is the medical issue that triggered this episode of home health to um, start. And so because he had the spinal cord injury and was not able to sit, stand prior to the current illness, exacerbation or injury, it would be coded 09. Okay, so here's the rationale, and again, this will be posted, um, the rationale, uh, if you had a question about that. So I think, let's see, at this point, I think I'm going to stop because I have uh, 40 seconds left. Um, so the uh, we do now have a break. I don't know if Bridget, yeah, Bridget is going to come up and give us some instructions. So uh, we will pick up uh, where we left off here um, after the break. Thank you, Bridget. Okay, we're going to get started again. Um, few people may still be getting coffee, but I think um, still have a fair bit of material to follow. So um, during the next 45 minutes, we'll kind of wrap up the mobility section, and then we will uh, talk at the end just very briefly about the quality measure. So moving on to the next slide. Great. Okay, so um, let's see. I think we left off, um, I wanted to cover the definition of the ched, chair bed uh, to chair tr transfer. And this is the ability to transfer uh, to and from a bed or chair. Could be a wheelchair also. Um, and in this case, uh, sitting to lying um, uh, are not assessed as part of this activity. So as you recall, we already covered that. So this uh, relates just to um, starting when the person is in a seated position. Um, if a mechanical lift is used uh, to assist in transferring the patient to a bed to chair tr 
transfer and two helpers are needed, then the code would be 01 dependent. And again, if you followed the decision tree, um, basically helpers are required and anytime you need two or more helpers, you, you I think know by now you're gonna go automatically to level one. Um, so we do have another practice coding scenario uh, related to this item. So if you can pull out your phones or computer, um, whether you're here or online, please feel free to give an answer. Um, so Mr. L had a stroke and uses a wheelchair for mobility. When Mr. L gets out of bed at SOC, the therapist moves the wheelchair into the correct position and locks the brake so that Mr. L can transfer into the wheelchair safely. Mr. L transfers into the wheelchair by himself without the need for supervision or assistance during the transfer. The family reports that Mr. L does transfer safely without the need of supervision once the wheelchair is placed and locked. The nurse does not expect Mr. L's mobility status to change by discharge. So again, key thing here um, to focus on is that somebody is indeed helping, um, but what they're doing is basically putting the wheelchair in a correct position so the person can transfer safely, and uh, the helper is also putting the brakes on, uh, again, for safety reasons. So if you uh, can put your response in that you think is the correct code for this gentleman, um, code five uh, would be set up Cleanup assistance, four would be supervision or touching assistance, nine would be not applicable, eight would be, um, 88 would be not attempted due to medical uh, concern or medical condition, safety concern. Okay, looks like uh, there is a favorite code. Um, so many of you are coding five, and I would agree with that. So if we go to the correct response, you'll see indeed, yes, code five is the correct response. Uh, there was just set up or clean up, it said that the, no supervision was required during the actual transfer. In terms of the goal, it said that he was expected to maintain, so how would you code his goal in this instance? And I will let you put in your responses. Okay, so it looks like most of you are saying 05. So it did say that it was expected to be maintained um, in terms of his functional abilities. So I would agree with the code five. So if we, yep, indeed five is the correct response. And again, the rationale here in the slides if you need to refer to that later. Okay, next we're moving to toilet transfer here. That's the ability to get in um, and out, on and off a toilet or a commode. Um, just a, a tip related to transferring um, on and off the toilet, toileting hygiene and clothing management are not considered as part of the toilet transfer activity. So those things will all kind of happen together. But when you're coding, you're going to kind of think through was, let's say, steadying assistance provided during the time that the person, let's say, was pulling their pants up and down, um, or perhaps while they were doing some cleansing, um, and was um, steadying assistance provided during the transfer also. And so both may actually end up having the same code if somebody has a balance problem, um, but they are separate activities. So we have an, another example here. Um, so uh, for toilet transfer at SOC, Mrs. S is uh, on bed rest due to a med new medical condition. She uses a bedpan for bladder and bowel management. The assessing clinician expects that the patient will return to independent use of the bathroom uh, toilet once the current condition resolves. So at start of care, um, the person, it says, is um, on bed rest. So the person in this case would not be getting on and off a commode or toilet. Um, and then at discharge, the person is expected to be independent. So first of all, at start of care, how would you code um, the person? The options are two, substantial maximal assistance, one, dependent, nine, not applicable, 88, not attempted due to medical condition or safety concern. Looks like most of you are coding 88. Um, the person is on bed rest, not able to transfer. So one of the activity not attempted codes would indeed be correct. So let's see what the correct response is. 
uh, 88, as most of you indicated. And then it said that at discharge, uh, the person was expected to uh, no longer be on bed rest and would be independent. How would you code that uh, for a discharge goal? So options are six, five, three, and two. Okay, it looks like uh, most people are coding independent, so let's see what the right response is. Indeed, uh, six is the correct response, and here is the rationale. Next activity is car transfers. Um, so car transfer relates to the ability to transfer in and out of car or van on the passenger side. It does not include opening or closing the door or fastening the seatbelt. So it's truly just, you know, once somebody has opened the door or the patient opens uh, the, the car door, just the assessment would be getting in and out of uh, the car on the passenger side. So it... Um, if the patient is not able to attempt car transfers, for example, no car is available, or there are weather or environmental limitations, and the patient's usual status cannot be determined based on the patient or caregiver report, you would code 10, not attempted due to environmental limitations. So the code 10 um, should, like when it's being used, this is an item where it makes sense. It doesn't really make sense for an item like eating that there's an environmental limitation. I'm not sure what that would mean if there's no food available. Um, but anyway, code 10 definitely makes sense for car transfer or walking on uneven surfaces. So, and it again relates to there's equipment issues or environmental issues. If at the time of the assessment, the patient is unable to attempt car transfers and could not perform the car transfers prior to the current illness, exacerbation, or injury, you would code 09, not applicable. We do have a practice scenario here. So um, the day after being admitted to home health, Mrs. N works with the occupational therapist on transfers in and out of the passenger side of the car. The reviewing when reviewing the therapist's evaluation, the assessing clinician, so let's say it's a nurse, reads that when performing car transfers, Mrs. N required verbal reminders for safety and contact guard assistance from the OT for guidance and direction. The therapist instructed the patient on strategic hand placement while Mrs. N uh, transitioned to sitting into the car seat. Documentation showed that the therapist opened and closed the car door. So again, knowing the definition, opening and closing the car door is not included, so we don't worry about that help. Um, so then we have to think about whether the helper actually provided assistance, and it sounds like the, pa the um, patient required verbal reminders and contact guard assistance. So how would you code that uh, for this patient. So options are code five, super uh, setup or cleanup assistance, four, supervision or touching assistance, three, partial moderate assistance, two, substantial maximal assistance. And it looks like most people are coding four. I do agree with that response. Let's see what the correct response is. It is indeed 04. And here's the rationale. Okay, next we're uh, moving into the walking items. Um, and so the definition of walking 10 feet refers to one standing, the ability to walk at least 10 feet in a room, corridor, or similar space. Um, as I mentioned before, there is a skip pattern here. So if you actually look at what's highlighted in yellow, if the person does not walk the, a minimum of 10 feet, um, you would be coding one of the activity not attempted codes and then you would be able to skip over and actually would not be able to enter a code for uh, the next item, 50 feet with two turns and 150 feet. You are skipping over the performance column. You may certainly enter a goal if you'd like to for any and all walking items if you'd like to. Um, in terms of a coding tip for 10 feet, use of assistive devices and adaptive equipment, for example, a cane or a leg brace required to complete the activity would not increase or decrease the score. It doesn't affect the score. Code the patient based on the amount of assistance provided with or without an assistive device, whatever is appropriate for that patient. 
We do have a practice scenario. Um, Mr. L has bilateral had bilateral amputations three years ago, and prior to his home health admission, he used a wheelchair and did not walk. At start of care, Mr. L does not use prosthetic devices and only uses a wheelchair for mobility. Mr. L's care plan includes assisting with fitting and use of bilateral lower extremity prostheses. The therapist's care plan is for Mr. L to walk distances of 30 feet with supervision within his home and then discharge to outpatient therapy. So you're gonna be asked to code um, start of care performance as well as a goal here for this particular scenario. So again, just start of care, it says that he does not use prosthetic devices and only uses a wheelchair for mobility. And then for the goal, um, it says that the plan is that he'll be able to walk distances of 30 feet with supervision. So for start of care, um, how would you code his performance? Options are 01, 09, 88, or 07. Okay, it looks like there is a preference for one of the activity not attempted codes, which I would agree with. And um, he had a longstanding um, uh, um, inability to walk, and so I would agree the code 9. Let's see what the correct answer is. Indeed, it is 09, not applicable. And then in terms of goal, how would you code that? Options are six, independent, five, set up or clean up assistance, four, supervision, touching assistance, or three, partial, moderate assistance. And it looks like most of you are coding 04. It did say he would be able to walk 30 feet, so he definitely meets the 10 feet uh, requirement for this particular item. And it mentioned supervision was expected, so I would agree 04. Let's see what the correct response is. Yes, indeed, it is 04. And here is the rationale. Now we're moving to walk 50 feet with two turns for this particular item. Again, it starts once the person's in a standing position and the person's ability to walk 50 feet while making two turns. One question that we've had um, across all the settings is how do you define turns? So turns are, de are defined by 90 degree turns, so around a corner. The two turns could be in the same direction or they could be in different directions, one left, one right, or two right turns or two left turns. Um, it doesn't matter. Two turns that are 90 degrees are acceptable. Um, it should occur at the um, patient's ability level, obviously in a safe manner, and it can include um, any assistive devices that the person uses. They may certainly obviously use those as they're being assessed. We do have a practice scenario. Um, this is number 11. Uh, walk 50 feet with two turns. At start of care, Mr. B is recovering from a recent stroke and now has difficulty walking. Even with assistance, he's able to walk only 30 feet. Mr. B's care plan includes muscle strengthening and gait training. The therapist expects Mr. B will be able to walk 50 feet with two turns safely with the assistance of a caregiver for verbal cues and contact guard for steadying assistance on the turns at discharge. So at start of care, it says that he's only able to walk 30 feet. Now, this particular item asks about 50 feet and because you won't be, you can't actually walk for somebody. Um, if the person can't walk the full distance, you would coat, so whether it's 10 feet, 50 feet, or 150 feet, if the person doesn't walk the entire distance, you would code one of the activity not attempted codes. So in this instance, he's not able to walk the entire distance. He's had a recent stroke, and so the implication is he was able to walk prior to um, the current uh, event that happened, the stroke. And again, in terms of goal, it says that he's expected, in terms of a goal, to be able to get assistance um, from a caregiver for verbal cues and contact guard by discharge. So let's first of all code start of care, uh, resumption of care, and the options are to code two, substantial maximal assistance, 01, dependent, nine, not applicable, or 88, not attempted due to medical condition or safety concern. Looks like most people are coding 88. Um, so let's see what the right answer is. 
indeed, 88 is the correct response. Uh, he was not able to go the full distance, and so it would be one of the activity not attempted codes. In terms of goals, um, what's your uh, assessment of his abilities? Uh, options that you can code to enter are independent, uh, set up cleanup assistance, supervision or touching assistance, partial, moderate assistance. Looks like a few more people are entering. Okay, so it looks like most people are coding four, and I would agree with that. So let's see what the correct response is. Indeed, it is, oops, sorry, jumped ahead here. Indeed, uh, the correct response is four. Um, so again, uh, on admission, uh, start of care, 88, and then the goal was uh, four. Next is walking 150 feet. Um, so this, again, starts when the person's in a standing position, and it's the person's ability to walk 50 feet in a corridor or similar space. Um, if the patient's environmental um, situation uh, does not accommodate walking 150 feet straight, uh, you can certainly do the assessment allowing the person to do turns um, with, as long as it's safe uh, without jeopardizing the patient's safety. So we do have a practice scenario. Mr. R has recently um, has recent endurance limitations due to exacerbation of heart failure and is only walking 30 feet before he tires, loses strength, and must sit down and rest. He reports he has been walking 150 feet or more with his cane prior to the exacerbation of his heart failure. How would you code this gentleman for the um, being able to walk only 30 feet before he tires? So code options are 01, dependent, 09, not applicable, 88, not attempted due to medical condition or safety concerns, and 7, patient refused. Looks like most people are coding 88. Um, I do agree with that. And the correct response in this instance is indeed 88. And here is the rationale. Um, again, he was not able to perform the activity. We do sometimes get questions, by the way, on help desk about whether somebody can sit down in the middle of walking, and the answer is no. Um, basically, somebody can take a breather, and we use, let you use your clinical judgment about what a breather is, um, but they do need to walk the entire distance of 150 feet for this particular item without sitting down in order to get uh, coded in the one through six activity codes. The next activity is walking 10 feet on uneven surfaces. Again, this relates to the ability to walk 10 feet on uneven um, or sloping surfaces. Could be indoor or outdoor, such as turf or gravel. If the patient is unable to attempt walking on uneven surfaces, for example, because um, uneven surfaces are not available or there are weather or environmental considerations that limit your ability to assess this particular activity for a patient, you can code 10, not at at uh, attempted due to environmental limitations. We do have a practice scenario um, for this particular item. So Mr. N has severe joint degenerative disease and re is recovering from sepsis. When walking on uneven driveway, when walking on the uneven driveway, um, which was attempted yesterday when Ms. Mrs. N came home from the hospital, uh, she reports that her neighbor had to hold her belt and help lift her a a little during a few steps. Uh, the neighbor also provided help to advance the walker across the gravel driveway as the patient walked. So there's basically the, the patient report of what happened uh, when she was walking up her sloping driveway, uneven driveway, so that does count as an uneven surface. She reports that the helper provided a little bit of assistance uh, with a few steps and um, the, the neighbor, the helper in this instance, also held on to her, her belt. How would you code this particular uh, scenario? Options are five, set up cleanup assistance, four, supervision touching assistance, three, partial moderate assistance, two, substantial maximal assistance. Okay, it looks like 
many of you have entered the code and you have selected three. Let's see what the correct response is. Um, three is indeed correct. The patient was doing more than half of the effort and so the code three was indeed correct. And here is the rationale. Okay, next we're moving on to one step. So uh, here, uh, this refers to the ability to go up and down one step and or um, down uh, one step or a curb. And again, there's a skip pattern, as I mentioned, that um, uh, applies to the performance column. Uh, we do have a practice scenario here. Um, Mrs. Z had a stroke and needs to learn how to step up and down one step to enter her home. At Starter Care, the physical therapist provides needed verbal cueing as Mrs. Z uses her quad cane to aid her balance in stepping up and back down one step. The therapist does not provide any physical assistance. It is just verbal cueing. How would you code uh, this patient? Options are 04, supervision or touching assistance, 3, partial moderate assistance, 2, substantial maximal assistance, or dependent. Okay, it looks like many of you have entered a four. Um, I agree, so let's see what the correct response is. And you are, of course, correct. I think that was 100%, so that's great. Now we're moving to four steps. So this is, again, the ability to go up and down four steps. It can be with or without a railing. Um, again, if the person cannot go up and down four steps, if you use one of the activity not attempted codes, you would skip over the 12 steps. Uh, again, use of the assistive device uh, or a railing can be um, completed as part of safe performance of the activity. You would not increase or decrease the score based on the use of a railing or assistive device. So the scenario here, um, at start of care, Mr. J has lower body weakness and the physical therapist provides light touching assisting assistance as he ascends four steps. While descending four steps, the physical therapist faces the patient and descends the steps providing minimal trunk support with one hand on the patient's hip and the other holding the gate belt as Mr. J holds the stair railing. How would you code this scenario? Options are five, set up or clean up assistance, four, supervision or touching assistance, three, partial or moderate assistance, to substantial maximal assistance. Okay, looks like many of you have coded three. Let's see what the correct response is. Um, you are correct indeed. Uh, level three, partial moderate assistance. It was more than just touching, but the patient was doing more than half of the effort if you're following or thinking about the decision tree. Next is 12 steps. Um, so again, ability to go up and down 12 steps can be with or without railing, with or without any assistive device the patient would be using. If at the time of the assessment, the patient is unable to complete the activity due to uh, physician prescribed restriction, for instance, no stair climbing for two weeks, but could perform the activity prior to the current illness, exacerbation, or injury, uh, you would code 88 not attempted to medical condition or safety concern. We do have a scenario at start of care. Ms. Y is recovering from a stroke and has 12 steps with a railing, and she needs to use these stairs to enter and exit her home. The physical therapist used a gate belt around her trunk and at times is required to support much of Ms. the patient's weight as Mrs. Y ascends and then descends the 12 steps. So here, if you're thinking about the decision tree, it says that the helper um, was required to, uh, to support much of her weight. So you'll need to make a determination based on this about whether the helper is performing more than half of the effort or the helper is performing less than half of the effort. Options to code are 05, set up cleanup assistance, four, supervision or touching assistance, three, partial moderate assistance, two, substantial maximal assistance. And I will let you put in your answers. Um, and again, if you're following the decision tree, um, if the patient is doing more than half of the effort, you'd go with three. If the helper is providing more than half of the effort, you'd go with level two. Looks like many people are coding D, which is O2, substantial maximal assistance. Um, I do agree with that response. 
and the rationale is indeed that the uh, patient is doing less than half of the effort. The um, last activity here is um, pick up object, and this, oops, sorry, um, this relates to the person um, starting in a standing position and being able to pick up a small object such as a spoon from the floor. If at the time of the assessment the patient is unable to complete the activity, for example, the person is not able to stand, um, then you would code, and, and this is something that's uh, been ongoing for the person prior to the current illness or event that triggered the home care, um, you would code 09 not applicable. We do have a practice scenario here. Um, Mrs. C has recently undergone a hip replacement. At start of care, she walks with a walker without assistance. When she drops a hairbrush from her walker basket, she asks her daughter to locate the long-handled reacher and bring it to her. Using the reacher, Mrs. C is able to bend slightly and safely pick up the hairbrush with the reacher without need of assistance or verbal cues. So in this instance, she uses a device, which is perfectly fine, uh, to complete the activity. And so you would code based on the amount of assistance. In this case, it's her daughter um, who is actually, um, who locates the reacher and provides it to the patient. So how would you code this scenario? The options are 05, 04, 03, and 02. So in this case, the daughter is the helper. Looks like most people are coding 05. I do agree with that. And let's see what the correct response is. It is indeed 05. OK, so now we're moving to the wheelchair items. And there is. Um, at the, so the first question related to wheelchair is basically a gateway or a screening question saying, does the person use a wheelchair and or scooter? And if you answer no, then you would skip over the remaining wheelchair items because they're not relevant. If you say yes, you would then get to the next item, which is asking about wheeling uh, 50 feet with two, two turns. So you would be using clinical judgment to determine if the patient's use of wheelchair is for self-mobilization due to the patient's medical condition or uh, safety concern. If the patient is ambulatory and not learning how to mobilize in a wheelchair and only uses the wheelchair for transport within a larger facility, let's say it's somebody who's living in an assisted living facility or a large apartment complex, um, or maybe the person just uses it for um, community mobility, um, for instance, going to a doctor's appointment or dialysis. Um, and so they're really not using the wheelchair as their main um, mode of getting around. It's just for transport purposes. You would code no. And then you would skip out the items. If you, are, um, if you do have a patient who is using a wheelchair for mobilization, um, then you would be coding these items. And so the question is, how much assistance is needed for the person to mobilize? And so the first activity is related to wheeling 50 feet with two turns. So this is similar to the walking item, but obviously in a wheelchair. So it starts when the person is seated. And again, it could be in a wheelchair. Uh, could be a manual wheelchair, could be a motorized wheelchair or a scooter, and it relates to being able to go 50 feet with two turns. We talked about turns, it's the same definition as we talked about before, 90 degree turns. We do have a scenario here to practice together. Um, at start of care, Mrs. M is unable to bear weight on her right leg due to a recent fracture. The nurse observes as the certified nursing assistant in the assisted living facility provides steadying assistance when transferring Mrs. M from the bed into her manual wheelchair. Once in the wheelchair, Mrs. M propels herself safely about 60 feet down the hall using her left leg and safely makes two turns without any necessary physical assistance or supervision. So first of all, it does talk about a transfer, but all we have to worry about for this particular item when we're coding this example, is uh, wheeling 50 feet with two turns. So it says she propels herself 60 feet, so she does meet the minimum distance of 50 feet, and um, she does make two turns, so she does meet the um, 
definition criteria of the 50 feet and the two turns. And it says that she um, makes the, those turns without any necessary physical assistance or supervision. So um, how would you code uh, this particular item? Options are six, independent, five, set up or clean up assistance, four, supervision or touching assistance, three, partial or moderate assistance. Okay, looks like most people are coding independent. Let's see what the right answer is. It is indeed independent. So um, for the, those of you who may be coded a little bit lower, um, remember that the wheelchair items start when the person's seated in the wheelchair. And so anything related to transfer would not be considered. So once the person's seated in the wheelchair, that's really when the assessment starts for the wheelchair items. Here's the rationale. So after you've told us uh, um, about the person's ability to wheel 50 feet, um, some individuals may be using a motorized wheelchair or a scooter. Some people may use a manual wheelchair. So there is a follow-up question for this particular wheelchair item, as well as the um, next uh, wheelchair item, which is 150 feet. And so we just ask uh, whether the patient is using a manual wheelchair or um, a motorized wheelchair or scooter. Um, somebody might use one type of wheelchair for a shorter distance and maybe a motorized wheelchair for a longer distance. So we do ask actually at both, both instances, 50 feet and 150 feet. 150 feet, similar to the 50 feet, basically is about um, being able to um, self-propel or assistance required to self-propel uh, once seated in a wheelchair going 150 feet. Um, similar to the 150 feet for walking, if you need to put turns in there in order for the person to be able to complete 150 feet, that is absolutely acceptable uh, given that somebody's home may not be that large. We do have a practice scenario here. Mr. N uses a below the knee prosthetic limb. Mr. N has peripheral neuropathy and limited vision due to complications of diabetes. Via observation and patient report, the assessing clinician determines that Mr. N's usual performance is that a helper is needed to provide verbal cues for safety due to vision limitations, and the patient mobilizes his manual wheelchair a distance of 150 feet within his home. So it says that there's verbal cues for safety that are needed. So if you're thinking through decision tree, how would you code this? Options are 06, independent, 5, set up or clean up assistance, 4, supervision or touching assistance, uh, 3, partial moderate assistance. Okay, it looks like most people are coding level 4. Um, so let's see what the correct response is. Okay, so the correct, um, oops, sorry. So the correct response is for because there's verbal assistance. So it's more than just set up or clean up assistance. It is actual uh, supervision touching assistance because that includes verbal assistance. And um, here is the rationale. Okay, so in the remaining time, so we have about 10 minutes left, um, I did want to just walk through a little bit the quality measure. So I think I mentioned at the beginning of this session um, that there is one quality measure that is associated with the Section GG items at this point. And that one quality measure is a process measure. So basically it's looking at whether there are valid codes, and that means not dashes, um, for the uh, selected items that are included in this cross-setting quality measure. So as I said before, the name of the quality measure is application of the percent of LTAC patients with an admission and discharge assessment and a care plan that addresses its function, and that's just because it's an adopted um, measure from another setting. So uh, this application measure, um, again, is just a process measure. So do you have, a, do you have valid scores there of 06 um, for performance? Uh, you're allowed to use one of the activity not attempted codes. So again, process measure is calculated. It is not risk adjusted because it's just whether you put a code there. If somebody has significant limitations, you can co code the activity not attempted code. So those are still valid codes for performance. 
And as I said before, this uh, quality measure has been implemented across um, all of the post-acute care settings. Um, the measure reports the percent of episodes a, um, with a SOC ROC and a discharge functional assessment and a treatment goal that addresses function. The treatment goal provides evidence that a care plan with the goal has been established for the patient. For this quality measure, documentation of a goal for one or more of the function items reflects that a care plan addresses function. The function goal is recorded at SOC ROC for at least one of the standardized self-care or mobility function items using the six level rating scale. So basically, um, at the beginning of the presentation, I showed you the column on the SOC ROC. It has the one column for performance, second column is for goals. For the quality measure, there is only a check that at least one self-care or mobility goal, so one of the GGO-130 or GGO-170 items, has a goal of 01 through 06. At the time of discharge, the self-care mobility performance is reassessed uh, using the same level six, six, same six level rating scale. So in terms of the quality measure, just to make it a little bit more visual, um, this is just reinforcement. So I'm going to start with the denominator. So this is who is included in the measure. So it's the number of Medicare, Medicaid, including Advantage programs covered home health episodes of care for patients who are at least 18 years of age, ending during the reporting period. And among those patients, the numerator will be the number of home health quality episodes with the functional assessment data for each self-care or mobility activity and at least one self-care or mobility goal. So there's really three pieces of information that are being looked at with the quality measure. Number one here is that on admission that there is a, a code of one of the zero through six independent through dependent, one of those codes, or one of the activity not attempted codes. In terms of goals, at least one goal is coded for one of the self-care or mobility act activities using the 01 through 06 codes. And then the third component of the quality measure, so one, two, three pieces being looked at, the third component is uh, one of the um, zero through six or one of the activity not attempted codes is coded at discharge. Um, exclusions, so uh, maternity patients are excluded, patients younger than 18, non-Medicare Medicaid patients, and patients who are not receiving skilled home services. Denominator exclusions, um, there are none. Um, I did want to make special attention for incomplete episodes. So in the event that um, a, a patient, uh, their home health episode ends with a qualifying admission to an inpatient setting, so a transfer or there's a death um, at home, the discharge functional assessment data are not required because obviously you're not in a position to collect that data. Um, and so they're not required. So um, for these patients to be counted in the numerator, uh, CMS is only looking at the admission information that there are codes one through six or one of the activity not attempted codes on admission. They will also look to see that at least one goal is established and encoded in the goal column for at least one of the self-care or mobility activities. And then for discharge, you're not able to do that assessment. And so again, if it's an incomplete episode, um, discharge is not required. A subgroup of items are included in this quality measure. And again, this is a cross-setting measure. And so these were the activities that were um, selected for cross-setting cross um, purposes. So there's three self-care activities, eating, oral hygiene, and toileting hygiene. And then for mobility, um, this slide has some of the items, next slide has some. So the mobility items are sit to lying, lying to sit on side of bed, sit to stand, chair to bed transfer, toilet transfer. For patients who are walking, uh, two of the walking items, 50 feet with two turns, 150 feet. For patients who use the wheelchair, complete the following items, 50 feet with two turns, and wheel 150 feet. 
just in terms of a summary, um, we've covered a lot of information this morning. Um, so I really do appreciate your attention and all of the uh, responses that you've provided to us. Um, it sounds like you've done really well. From what I saw, I agreed with a lot of the answers. Um, so what we covered is that Section GG assesses need for assistance for self-care mobility. So I hope one of the key things that you got out of this is the decision tree to think through how to code. The bottom line is how much assistance, how much help or assistance was needed for the patient to complete the activity. And so that's the theme for all of the activities. Um, these items were um, added to OASSD in support of the cross-setting quality measures. Uh, Section GG items are different than the M items, and Section GG 130 items and GG 0170 items use the six-level rating scale, which we talked about in the decision tree, um, and you're assessing performance and goals at uh, start of care and resumption of care. Um, if you would like to, uh, we do have three minutes left. If you would like to enter any of your ide um, ideas about action plans, uh, feel free to enter those into Slido. Um, I think we may be able to share some of those if uh, you enter some of those. So let's see if there's anything that's been entered. Oh, oh. So, but they you, can en you can enter it on your paper. Thank you, Bridget. All right, so um, we will then move. Um, I would encourage you to enter any questions into Slido, and there is uh, an opportunity later to review uh, those questions that you've submitted, and we'll provide some answers. Uh, there will also be other materials following training that I'm sure Bridget will address later so that uh, we can address all your questions. But as I said, I really appreciate all your attention and uh, focus on answering the questions. It looks like you have a good handle on this. So thank you very much.